Greetings, weather watchers, and welcome to another edition of Weather Gone Wild here on the Doomstead Diner. In our last edition, we covered the wave of flooding episodes going on around the world, and that was actually recorded before the massing flooding events in Missouri and other parts of the Midwest over the holiday weekend. The powerful El Nino in progress in the eastern Pacific, combined with the general rise in ocean heat content over the last 20 years, are combining to bring freak weather events freakishly often these days. And one has to ask the question of whether the term freak is even appropriate anymore. It's the new normal. The news stories should read. There was another normal weather event today, when the Hudson River overflowed its banks and washed Manhattan Island out to sea. Thousands of Wall Street pigmen drowned in the flood, and the world rejoiced. <laughs> One can only hope. The same El Nino-driven weather system brought 40 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures over the North Pole in midwinter, a good 50 degrees over the normal temperatures for this time of year. That brought us here in Alaska high winds and a lot of rain, taking out my power for a few hours, but otherwise, so far, we have been relatively unscathed by major weather disasters. Except, they'll probably have to start the Iditarod somewhere north of here again this year, because once again, there's little to no snow cover in the Matsu Valley. Not so fortunate, however, was Missouri, where Table Rock Lake set a new record for discharging water at the dam, flooding the homes of numerous country music legends. <laughs> As I write this rant today, Water is making its way down the Mississippi River, threatening to overtop levees in St. Louis, then Memphis, and working its way down to New Orleans, where once again we'll get to see how well their levee system holds up. Even before that, though, numerous stretches of the river are closed to barge traffic, oil pipelines coming from Cushing have been shut down, and sections of I-44 and other major roads that are major trucking arteries have been closed as well, all of which is bringing business to a practical halt in the Midwest. Deal here is, the El Nino isn't even up to full speed yet, and meteorologists from Jim Cantori to Jeff Masters to Al Roker all are warning that the worst may be yet to come. They always drop the word may in there just in case the predictions don't come true. <laughs> However, you don't need to be a weatherman to know which way the wind is blowing here. Anyhow, this tidies up on the latest in flooding events. What other kind of wild and wacky weather is the new normal here this winter? Tornadoes! Nice big tornadoes down in Tornado Alley in Texas, this time hitting Garland and Roulette, basically suburbs of the Dallas-Fort Worth metro. Still waiting for some of these monsters to hit the downtown areas and take out a few skyscrapers. They mostly don't do that, though, because the circulation is too disturbed in these areas for this type of cyclonic flow to develop. They mostly hit on large swaths of flat land, usually where the cheapest housing is available, trailer parks and the like. So most of the tornado victims are usually the working poor rather than the upper classes, although they periodically get hit too, just not as often. It's not a lot different than the flood situation, which also hits the lower class the hardest. The cheapest land is always in dicey areas in a given neighborhood, while the upper class lives on the high ground. Thus, when New Orleans got flooded out, it was the poorest parishes that went under the deepest water, and also were the last to get fixed up if they ever were. There are still portions of Plaquemines Parish and St. Bernard's Parish that are abandoned and unlivable to this day. Back to the tornadoes, though. The ones that hit in Garland and Roulette are certainly not the first in the neighborhood, nor will they be the last. The neighborhood there is called Tornado Alley for a reason. Going back a couple of years, Joplin, Missouri had a whopper run through that town, and they haven't fully recovered from that one either. They're certainly deeper in debt because of it. Because even when the federal government steps in with FEMA guaranteed loads for rebuilding, they are exactly that, loans. If you want to rebuild and wait for the next tornado to hit, you have to borrow money to do it. At a somewhat lower interest rate than you might otherwise get without the federal guarantee, but it is still a loan. If you still had $100,000 left on your old mortgage from your now-demolished McMansion and take out a FEMA loan to rebuild it for another $200,000, after the tornado, now instead of being 100000 in debt, you are 300000 in debt. Even at low interest, can you service $300,000 in debt? In the last few years, the frequency and intensity of tornadoes hitting these neighborhoods has increased substantially over the last 60 years, as the graph from the NOAA demonstrates. 
This, of course, only makes sense when you realize that increasing heat content in the global oceans transfers itself into the atmosphere in the form of more violent weather. Although they tend to be more localized in destruction, the fact that tornadoes are quite common through the Midwest of the FS of A and happen every year means that every year you get one community or another flattened by these things, with the inevitable loss of life besides the property damage. You have the typical news story interview with the victims, where they always say they are just happy to be alive. How happy are they six months later, when they are still homeless, or they have new debt service, double or triple, what they had before the tornado flattened the neighborhood? Rarely, if ever, are follow-ups done on these major events a week or two after they occur, except in a local newspaper, if it's still printing. Each neighborhood grinds downward. Businesses that are flattened don't reopen. The population doesn't have money left over to go to the movies or frequent the fast food joints or even go to the dentist for some drilling. Poverty expands inexorably, and people in the affected locations migrate away, further undermining the local economy and tax base. A few aging people with pensions and Social Security hang on in these places because they are their lifetime homes, but they dwindle and wither in size as time goes by. At a certain point, there's not even enough money to keep the local convenience store open. The last of the young people move away, and the community dies, along with the few aging residents who still live there. This has been occurring in small towns across the fascist states of America for decades now. But almost imperceptibly, in a slow, boiling frog sort of way, what is occurring now is a vast acceleration of this process, so it now becomes visible, not imperceptible, in real time. Individual tornadoes by themselves while they wreak incredible havoc in the lives of the people they affect, do not individually seem to make much difference in the overall economy. However, what you get here as the frequency increases is death by a thousand cuts. On any given day, if you live in Tornado Alley, your entire life in the town you grew up in and made your life in can be ripped right from under you. In the course of just a few minutes for the whole town, a few seconds for your personal McCovel as the F5 passes over you. You'll emerge from the storm cellar when the TV crews arrive, and when they ask you how you feel, you will respond the way everybody does. I am just grateful to be alive. After a few months of homelessness, you may not be so grateful, and there will be no TV cameras around to record your emotions then. And that's all the doom, this time until next time on Weather Gone Wild, here on the Doomstead Diner.